know all the tags are local, but no one is friendly, at least the guys that I know. I consider it a real honor to introduce our keynote speaker today. Uh, the Honorable Paul Stockton serves as the Assistant Secretary of Defense and Homeland Defense uh, for President Obama and just recently left that office. Uh, Dr. Stockton uh, is a noted authority on Homeland Defense issues. He wrote extensively on this uh, in his uh, capacity as a senior research fellow at Stanford University. Dr. Stockton, other than serving the past few books here for the Cardinal, I have nothing to do with credibility and education on this matter. I wish I did, but I, I don't. But I'm a big Cardinal fan and wish them the best in the, in the foreseeable future. But uh, Paul has been a, a real advocate for this topic and for discussion here in the last couple of days. And I can tell you, as an adjutant general, there was no stronger ally we had in the department than Mr. Paul Stockton. He has uh, advocated for issues of concern to the states in his federal capacity, recognizing that it's the states that are the first responders, the ones that we in the mix will first and probably for the longest period of time. And through uh, no small effort by his leadership and his team, and also his great efforts here, he has made uh, our country stronger and has strengthened the ability of the National Guard throughout the 54 states and territories to, uh, to respond to disasters, whether it's a local disaster, such as a flood or a hurricane, something that's more typical, or certainly as we address these more catastrophic issues with uh, things such as EMP. So it's a, it's a great pleasure that I introduce my good friend and a great American, Dr. Paul Stockton. Bob, uh, thank you for those remarks, and thanks for everything that state national guards across the nation do every day to provide for the public safety and security of their citizens. I want to thank uh, Chuck Manto and InfraGuard uh, for hosting this event. And I want to thank all of you for focusing your energy, your attention, your intelligence on issues that don't always get the attention that they deserve, given the scale of the challenges that we have. I appreciated the uh, video clip there. It does provide some motivation. I actually take a different uh, approach to these challenges, though. That is, in addition to being scared, I think it's very important for us to remember that if we collaborate together, there are very important opportunities for progress. So rather than only imagine that the sky is falling and that we're going back to the Stone Age, I think there are very actionable, very practical steps that we can begin to take in order to build resilience against these kinds of hazards. I'd like to uh, discuss two topics in uh, particular. Uh, first of all, uh, cyber issues, since they were the focus of the uh, clip. But then I want to dive into uh, electromagnetic hazards, because I think that's a prime example of an issue that doesn't get the attention that it deserves. And I'm talking uh, not only about uh, severe solar storms, but of course EMP as well, because of the combination of E1 and E3 effects that are, are, are so challenging. First of all, in the cyber realm, I think the administration and its industry partners are making terrific progress in building the kinds of voluntary standards for prevention and protection that the nation is going to need. And I applaud those of you who are helping advance that progress. I see plenty of attention focused on the challenges of prevention and protection. I see very little focus on the challenges of response. And let me talk to you about the nature of this challenge and ask for you to work together with me in making progress in this regard as well. Given advances in the threat, SQL injects, everything that's going forward, the availability today of weaponized zero-day exploits, exploits for sale on the web in a completely unconstrained Wild West market, I believe that we cannot count on having perfect prevention perfect protection, even with intelligence, well, intelligent, well-informed investments in that realm. I believe we need to make the assumption that someday there will be a successful attack, either on the electric power grid or perhaps on multiple infrastructure se sectors simultaneously that depend on common uh, industrial control systems, control panels, everything else uh, that's essential to the functionality of these infrastructure sectors. Let me say it again. I think we need to continue to invest strategically in prevention and protection, but we also need to be mindful of the risk that someday, despite our best efforts, those measures will fail and that we will be called upon with the National Guard 
with all of the partners represented here, federal, state, local, and industry playing a vital role, to limit the damage, limit the risks to public health and safety, limit the risks to national security and the American economy that such an attack could create. There's a particular concern I have, and that is that the National Cyber Incident Response Plan, the Incident Management Plan for cyber issues that provides a basis for going forward for response on an interim basis today, is built around completely different organizing principles, would take the United States in a very different path than the national response framework that would govern the response to the physical damage that such an attack would create. Let me tell you in particular what I'm concerned with. The National Cyber Incident Response Plan, the interim plan that would guide the response to cyber attacks, how to scrub malware, how to deal with the cyber specific problems that a successful attack would create. It's organized in a way that does not provide for a leading role for our nation's governors. Our nation's governors are responsible under our constitution. They have the lead responsibility for the public health and safety of their citizens. To have a plan that doesn't put the governors and state governments front and center for helping to manage the process of response to a cyber attack, I believe that's unrealistic and I believe it fails to take advantage of core capabilities that need to be strengthened at, at the state level. In contrast, we have a proven national response framework where governors play an absolutely vital role, where governors identify what kinds of capabilities to request from the federal government when state capabilities run short. That's an example of the vital role and very effective role that governors played in Super Storm Sandy, in Irene, and all the other natural catastrophes, catastrophes that we faced in the past. I believe we need to leverage that terrific state level leadership. I need, I believe we need to find some way of integrating cyber specific response with the kinds of uh, management of the physical consequences of a cyber attack that does not exist today and that folks we are going to need when not if, I believe, there's a successful cyber attack on the infrastructure of the United States. Let me emphasize again though that as we make progress in the response realm, it's critical that the voluntary standards that are currently being refined by the administration and its industry partners, and indeed industry on a voluntary basis continuing to strengthen prevention protection, that's also essential. Let's just not forget about this other uh, policy realm that hasn't got the attention that it deserves. Let me turn now to EMP threats because it was a special area of concern for me in the Department of Defense. Of course, I, everything I say today is as a private citizen. I'm out of the business now, uh, but I remain concerned that EMP hazards don't get the attention that they deserve and especially that there are very actionable, very practical steps that can be taken to better understand the nature of the challenge so that we can make limited investments in protection and also in response that can dr drastically reduce the potential consequences of such an attack. Folks, the sky is not falling. It's not time to crawl into a cave. It's not time to play chicken little. It's time to think about intelligent, limited investments eminently affordable that could have huge benefits in terms of limiting the potential uh, damage of such an attack. Let me talk to you about a couple of particular uh, issues that I think we need to further address. In order to provide for targeted investment of capabilities to prevent and protect uh, uh, critical infrastructure, I think in some realms we still need a better understanding of what kind of physical damage E1 and E3 are going to cause to the systems on which we depend. And systems range all, to all, all the way from cars with their electronics heavy uh, uh, structure today, with the design of emergency vehicles so electronically heavy compared to some of the vehicles on which past EMP tests have been uh, conducted. How about the control panels 
for the emergency power generators that will absolutely be essential going forward should there be uh, an EMP attack and components of the grid, high voltage transformers uh, and other substations, everything else that's required for grid functionality, they suffer physical damage. To, to what extent are the kinds of black start capabilities and other components that are going to be required to shorten the recovery period but also provide for emergency power for those facilities that are absolutely vital to keep up and running, including chemical facilities, nuclear power plants, everything else that's required to limit the potential devastation of one of these attacks. I believe we need to do further analysis of what kinds of vulnerabilities exist and how limited, targeted, strategic investment in protection can have the biggest bang for the buck. Resources are constrained. Let's be smart about how we invest. And I think that requires further research and analysis. Secondly, I'm concerned that we haven't done enough to think about the environment within which we'd be trying to preserve the functionality of lifetime, lifeline systems of infrastructure in such an event. Sure, we can all think about the immediate damage, for example, to the electric power grid that an EMP attack would create. But if you think about what it's going to take to restore the functionality of the grid, that restoration effort is going to depend on other infrastructure sectors that are themselves going to be severely compromised by an EMP attack, either directly or indirectly because of the loss of electric power. Let me give you a couple of prime examples. Transportation assets are going to be absolutely vital if, for example, the industry's terrific current a transformer reserve program, the SLEP program, could be expanded in a targeted intelligent way. So utilities can leverage their current very strong abilities to provide for uh, additional transformer support if transformers in a limited area were, were destroyed by an EMP attack. These are big honking transformers, right? Some of them require special rail cars to transit. Others can be taken uh, by trucks. But the ability of our transportation systems to function and enable those high voltage transformers to get where they need to be, that is going to be severely compromised by the same e EMP event and by the cascading failure of critical infrastructure that will result from the attack. Same thing for communications. I am concerned, I'm concerned today folks, that for a variety of threat vectors, we are not going to have the communications facilities, the communications capabilities that the nation is going to need in order to provide for the restoration of grid functionality, in order to get lifeline infrastructure back up and running. I'm worried that our communications sector is going to be severely compromised. I'm worried that utilities won't necessarily have access to the kind of reliable spectrum for network communications that are going to be essential so utility crews know where to go, know what kinds of operations are going to be uh, conducted, and how to provide for the targeted <coughs> restoration of power and other critical lifeline infrastructure in this severely disrupted environment. This is an area for further analysis that I think is absolutely vital. That is the cascading failure of the very infrastructure that we're going to need to get electric power and everything else that we need back up and running. And then finally, I want to emphasize the need uh, going forward to take actionable concrete steps. My view is we've done a lot of admiring of the problem and I've suggested some further ways in which we can admire the problem. For example, to better understand the physical vulnerabilities of critical infrastructure components to E1 and E3. But even as we better understand vulnerabilities, I think it's important as the state of Maine has done, as other states are beginning to consider to do, as the National Guard is doing across the nation, and of course, as key components of the federal government provide leadership, it's important to begin to think about what we can do in concrete, step-by-step -step ways to support industry, to help industry take the lead in protecting critical infrastructure against these kinds of threats. So, uh, those are some very brief remarks. I, uh, because I'm a former professor, I'd love to speak ad nauseum, but I won't inflict that kind of torture on you. Instead, I'd like to hear your thoughts 
answer any questions, welcome your perspectives before we turn it over to a, a far more distinguished panel uh, than I am. Yes, please. And if you could introduce yourself, please. Thank you. And um, I appreciate your comments because uh, it makes me happy to know that I'm not the only one who lays a night thinking about these things. Um, specifically, the, the thing I'd like to put out to the audience, to the people that think about these things in a far more scientific way than I, have the technical capabilities to solve these problems. Law enforcement, the people, uh, the emergency responders that are, that are going to be called upon to try and restore order, keep things moving along, um, keep the scenarios that we saw on, the, on that video clip from, from happening, uh, is becoming increasingly more dependent on pushing um, electronics and access to databases uh, down to the field level to the extent that we have mobile devices in cars. Um, the New York City Police Department has uh, uh, smartphone uh, applications for, for its uh, detectives to be able to query databases. You know, in the Fire and Rescue Service, we're increasingly dependent on the ability to, um, to get information and transfer it in the field rapidly so that we can get it back for um, uh, uh, what they call, a, a, you know, the, at the fusion centers, the uh, um, common operating picture. And so I think everybody's concerned about getting utilities back online. That's all well and good, but the pointy end of the spear needs to be protected as well, and, and more thought needs to be given to the dependency of the first responders on the system. I completely agree with that. We're going to need those first responders. Uh, we're going to need their contributions. We're going to need the reliability of their communications all of their operational capabilities in this kind of scenario in a way that would be unprecedented. Do we have another question? Maybe as the, what we do is that the other question gets raised and answered. Maybe the panel can come towards the front and be ready so that we know that they're gathered. Uh, let me see. We had one hand here, one hand here. Um, and this has got to be really fast because uh, the other panel's about to start. Dr. Stockton, we, we met two years ago in Aspen, oh, and uh, nice you spoke you. at that time about plans in the Department of Defense to build power plants on bases and wheel power to the private sector. Uh, I've lost track of that. W where does that stand? The opportunity for the Department of Defense to be able to ensure that it can still execute its critical missions by virtue of having more reliable electric power in part potentially by having power generation on military facilities and providing for public-private partnerships to provide for uh, critical loads on military bases. That opportunity still exists. It's going forward, but maybe it's not going forward as fast as the threat would require us to make progress. Okay, one last question. I saw a bunch of hands around me, and that's it because we're the – okay, here we go. My name is Larry Ginter with Aztec in Scottsdale, Arizona. Mine is kind of a statement back to the first responders. Our group has worked as in patented technology. We've reached out to first responders, multiple cities. Multiple, we responded back to multiple cities to see if we could assist and let them be aware of briefings of the, some of the latest technology. And too often times, a, somebody at the desk or secretary says, oh, we have a consultant handling that, or it's already being addressed and we're not interested. And it goes no farther than that. So uh, if anybody here is a first responder type, you need to keep buzzword that if somebody calls that has offers solutions, I believe, to make sure that raises the top so somebody can make a, a, a realistic decision about if it's really valid or not. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's have the panel. Come